Wow, it's very exciting to be here. This is a total honor. I'm going to actually put a little timer here. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, I, I made this film with my brother, um, which was both really wonderful, and I don't know if anyone's ever worked with a sibling, but also the biggest challenge of my life. Um, and I'm very grateful to him, but, um, but it was challenging. And one of the main challenges um, about it was that what we really wanted to be able to do and what I was really hoping to do from my experience as an executive director of a small nonprofit that was trying to achieve a very, very ambitious goal with very few resources and having a really hard time measuring my effectiveness or even getting clear about what my strategy was, um, was to help funders, donors, and leaders and organizations to determine if they really were you know, were having the impact that they were trying to have and how to really adopt kind of a managing to outcome strategy or to employ performance management in their organizations. And I had read a lot about this, but I hadn't seen a film about it. And I really needed to be able to kind of see something, you know, really show me how, how does it work? What does high performing look like as an organization? How does performance management um, really work within the organization? So we set out, and it took us about two years, and as I said, um, it was quite a process, and I feel like we did come up with something now that is uh, something we're excited about being able to share, that I think we have some really, some good examples of what that looks like and how it works. And one of the things that, um, that we'll do, and I'm gonna show you a couple clips from the film, but one of the things that we do in the film is that we basically lay out that there are three major components to managing to outcomes, your model, your data system, and then assessment and adjustment. So this clip you're gonna see here is after we've talked about those three components, and then we're starting to profile an organization, which is ROCA, and um, you'll hear Anisha talk here, and we're looking at, we're looking at their model, and we're, we're, this clip is about their target population. And before I start it, I'll just say that one of the things that I think, why I want to show you this clip and why I think this is so important, is that in my, in my research and working on this film, target population turns out to be one of the biggest, most important issues, I think, facing nonprofits. It is massive. If you can get clear about who you're trying to serve, a lot of, a lot of the work that flows from there will be made a lot easier. As I mentioned about my organization, the organization that I ran, the Statewide Healthcare Advocacy Organization, our, our um, target population was every low-income Pennsylvanian, everyone in the state, that was a million people. So it was too ambitious for our resources. So we, we really, it was very, that made it very difficult to get clear about our goals, right? So I, I wanna show this clip and then I'll say a little bit more about um, about ROCA in particular's target population and how that works with their theory of change. What we wanted to do is really get back to really working the disconnected and disengaged groups was um, making a, a shift in the age groups we served, and it was a minor shift, and we went from 12 to 26 to 14 to 24. <clears throat> because the, the distinction between the 12 and 13 year olds and the 14 and 15 and up was that the amount of programming and the attention and energy that was spent by staff running programming for the 12 and 13 year olds who were all showing up took away, actually, the time that was needed and the energy needed to go find all the 14, 15, 16 year olds who weren't showing up, which is the group that we needed to go find. So, yeah, I mean, you can't have, it was a choice. We don't have to be everything to everyone. We need to be really intentionally and intentional and strategic for this group. And so here's what we have to do that. And it means that we can't do this anymore. Let's look at some of Roka's outcomes engagement, economic independence, moving out of harm's way. Not things that are particularly easy to measure, but very important nonetheless. 
Remember what Molly said about tracking. You're taking somebody else's money to get in somebody else's life to try to make a difference. You better be showing you can make a difference. <laughs> Everything that Roca does now is examined through the perspective of, will this help us get these kids to the right outcomes? And what are the right outcomes? The right outcomes is that the kids um, reattach themselves to education. The right outcomes are that these kids attach themselves to the workforce. And the right outcomes are that these kids give up living in um, violent ways and perpetuating violence against others, living out of harm's way. So I could point out an organization like ROCA, who, is, who, who actually has embedded the, com the concept of a transformational relationship right into the software. And so at any moment, um, all of ROCA's staff, the staff working with participants and, and the managers can understand the degree to which a youth is engaged in ROCA's programming. And they have a, um, a strict definition of what engagement means. So, oh well, we'll leave that up there. Um, so the first time I showed the film was at the Center for Effective Philanthropy conference, and after it, it showed, everyone politely clapped, and then, you know, were there questions, and this woman raised her hand, and she said, uh, engagement isn't an outcome. Like, you've totally missed the boat on this whole thing. I don't see how engagement is an outcome. And I thought that was really an interesting point, and it's something that the film doesn't go into, very, doesn't sort of explain better about how can engagement be an outcome. And it's an outcome for ROCA because of their target population. Because their target population are street-involved, gang-involved, uh, disengaged, disconnected youth. These are people who are not at risk. These are people who are living in harm's way in violent ways, right? So in order to get them into educational programs or get them into job development, they first have to achieve a meaningful change in the lives of those participants, which is engagement and connection to the program itself. And so I think that demonstrates really well that sometimes, sometimes our, um, our target populations have to dictate outcomes that might not sound quite right or be necessarily evidence-based, but if we're really clear about what they are and really clear about how it is that we're gonna be able, we're gonna measure that, then we'll know if we're having that intended effect. I think the film goes into their, their definition, but I just wanna say really quickly that um, how they measure it is, is another, I think, really interesting kind of important point, which is that they have a survey and an assessment that the participant p takes to determine if that participant's really engaged. But one of the things that they figured out through their performance management was that the, the other indicator that a person was engaged is that they had relapsed. And this is, I think, another just kind of a thing that you wouldn't, this is kind of counterintuitive, which is they were noticing that the participants eventually always relapsed. And when they would relapse at a, at a more advanced stage in the program, they would actually have a harder time, it would take longer for them to re-engage than if they just stayed in that beginning phase and relapsed there, then they could recover more quickly. So ROCA made relapse a indicator, an indicator for engagement, for the readiness to move on to education and employment outcomes. So I think, um, the other part of this is really giving them, Roka giving themselves a real, um, a real focus, a real strategy with this. As Anisha says, they figured out they couldn't be all things to all people, that they really had to figure out who they were trying to serve and get intentional and strategic about that and sort of focus on those folks. And that it was okay for them to have mistakes being made as long as they were being clear with their measurements about what you know, what was happening. Um, and this next clip, she speaks a little bit more to that. Just because you can't measure all the way out to impact doesn't mean there aren't metrics that can help you understand whether or not you're headed to where you want to head to, right? 
and that's what we need to focus on. What are the smart proxies? Because a lot of programs, you know, like, if you mess up in the program, you're out, all right? Like, you can't show up, you're out. Well, our whole point is, for our population, we want to work with a group that doesn't show up, so mm, we have to expect they're not going to show up and account for that in our, in our programming. Look at that in our indicators. You have to start where they're ready, so if they're, you know, not really in action about... Okay, so this is another thing that... Um that I think is really important about their indicators. When I was running the organization I was running, I was thinking of indicators or measures as something that needed to be very sophisticated. Like, when I, when I started reading about I was like, I gotta hire a statistician or somebody to help me figure this out. One of the things that Roca's done is they took the stages of change, the five stages of change, just pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation um, preparation, action, and then maintenance, and they've built it into their, their indicators to determine if someone is ready for employment or where they are on that scale of, of um, engagement in their job training. So not thinking about wanting to work, thinking about the benefits, referred to employment, engagement, and then placed in employment. And again, this allows them to, to only take those young people to a place where they're ready to go so that they're, they're staying very focused on what is appropriate for this person at this time. Another question that this brings up a lot with screenings of the film is, but it's so subjective, right? It's, you know, and I think that the, the answer is we have to be honest about the fact that, yeah, a lot of these are gonna be approximations. It, it is, like um, Kat Raschetta says in the film, these proxies to determine are we getting to where we wanna get to. Um, I, I really, I think that's okay that, that it is subjective. We can have research and evidence that supports what these proxies, but, but to have something like this, it doesn't have to be, you know, incredibly sophisticated. It just has to be clear enough that everyone in the organization understands it right and everyone's using it and tracking in the same way, which as we talked about, actually got the chance to talk to Odile Swift last night, who's been a client for a long time of ETO, and I got to work with um, when I worked for Social Solutions, and we talked about the kind of diligence that it takes, meetings and meetings and meetings, and Jill Nilsson as well, doing this with her staff, of looking at the data system, looking at these indicators, and making sure that everyone understands exactly what's meant by them. I think that that's one of the ways to cut down on maybe the unwieldiness of the subjectivity. If it's clear what each of these things mean to all of the staff, then everyone's sort of recording it um, you know, in, the same, in the same circumstance. One last qu quick clip for you. They probably won't get to action unless you kind of give them something to experience that might help them even think that they might want to work. So yeah, we built transitional employment. It's like practice, you know, athletes practice their sport. I mean, our young people have to practice how to go to work, you know. So that's model. It includes your target population, outcomes, indicators, and program activities. Now the next component of a managing to outcomes framework is data system. This is your navigational equipment, your compass. We know the word data turns a lot of people off, but it's this information that will help you know if you're on track to achieve your outcomes or if you need to make changes. We have to make sure that if we're not getting the results we thought we should be getting, um, doing what we said we were going to do, that we have processes to help us understand why we're not getting those results and what we need to fix in order to have them. You know, most nonprofit organizations and most staff at nonprofits um, want to do this. Um, uh, most have uh, implicitly or explicitly theories about why what they're doing is going to make a difference, uh, but it is putting in place the systems that allow you to do that and the sort of the, the discipline that that requires that's tough and it's particularly tough in the face of the pressing needs of those you're trying to serve and so so um, sometimes I think to folks it can feel like 
it can feel like a trade-off. Uh, if I'm focused on performance assessment, well then I'm not meeting this need that's right here in my face. And, and, and I think that the most effective organizations recognize that it's, that it's not a trade-off and that it is only when I've got the data that lets me know what's working and what's not that I can best address the needs and best serve whoever I'm trying to serve. You know, there's, there's a lot of justification rationale that it's, you know, all that work takes away from it being about the young people when in fact, I think it's the very thing that demonstrates the level of respect and love you have for the young people because you can show them something tangible for them to see the tangible results of their own change and then for you to make sure like you are having an impact. Otherwise, what's the point? So I, I want to just shift a little bit to talking about the relationship between foundations and grantees, and then the grantees, the organizations, and participants. And I, Robert talked a bit about partnership. That was actually DC Central Kitchen that you got to see a little bit of there in the film. I think the partnership issue is, is extremely important right now. And if we can view, as she says, it's the very thing, the data is what demonstrates the respect and love you have for, in this case, the young people. I think that demonstrating that, that, showing that partnership, here's what we're doing for you. We're tracking all of this information because we want to help you get to where you want to go. And this is how you can see that we're doing our job. And then essentially, we're doing the same thing for our funders, right? Here's what we're tracking. We're doing, we're, we're really, we're working hard to get here. I think that funders need to be able to also show also demonstrate what they're doing with the data that, you're, that, that we're giving to them, essentially, and seeing how that's informing decision making. And I think we need to think of it as the same kind of partnership as we think of with our participants. I know it sounds a little idealistic. I'll tell you that, as, again, as an executive director, I sat in front of heads of foundations and said, oh, yeah, it's going really well. And they would say, well, what can we do? What do you need? And it scared me. I would just, and I'm not suggesting that, that you guys are, uh, you know, this uh, non-transparent or something, but, but it was very hard for me to admit that, well, we are actually struggling deeply with trying to get every single person with a disability in the state of Pennsylvania into Medicaid on $300,000 a year. I mean, now that's clear to me that's crazy. But then I sat in front of... <laughs> I sat in front of a woman and said, it's really going well. We do a lot of good work. And, and you know, she cuts the check. It bothers me to this day. I don't know that that was the best use of that money. And it really, really still bothers me. And so I guess I would just pose to all of you this question and, and back to the issue of not having to be all things to all people, but having to be very focused on what we're trying to achieve with that specific target population and demanding that same kind of focus from our funders, that same kind of partnership that we demand of ourselves with our participants, with our funders. And I really do believe that that's the way we can change the sector and really be much, much more effective in serving the people that we intend to serve. So thank you very much. Questions for Kate? I really do welcome your questions. I hope you'll all come see the film tonight. And if you can't, you can find out more about it on savingphilanthropy.org. We're doing, we're doing screenings all over. And we'd love to screen the film for you and your organization. But please, any questions, I know it's hard, this kind of format, but I really welcome them because uh, I think that this is, this is really the important piece. And this is, this is what's great about this conference, is getting to interact a bit, so. I'll start with a question. OK. Um, so so the operating the way that you um, lay out in the film really allows somebody to understand what's working and what's not working. It allows people to understand what mistakes they're making. And so a lot, of, a lot of people in the funding community that I've had an opportunity to speak with would love it if a nonprofit organization that was looking for some money could walk into their office and say, um, here's what I do, here's my target, target population, and here are the things that I've done wrong. Here are the mistakes that I've made, and here's how I figured that out, and here's what I did to rectify those mistakes. 
I know you've been speaking all over the country, um, showing your film and, and talking to a, to a lot in the, in the funding community. Are you hearing the same thing? I am, and actually, there, there are a lot more foundations than I realize that have published uh, information about things that were abysmal failures, interventions that they tried, initiatives that didn't work, and I think that that's encouraging, and that do say that they wouldn't mind hearing from organizations that, to say, look, this isn't working, and we kind of have an idea why. It's actually a point that I, um, I wrote about in in, a, in our blog on the Saving Philanthropy website that I would welcome you all to participate in the discussion because I do think that calling for sort of permission to fail, I mean, look, we're trying to solve these massive social issues, right? Some of your organizations you're working with, you've got a, a whole bunch of programs, a lot of different target population, like outcomes that you're trying to achieve that are massively complex or else they wouldn't be lingering. They're huge social issues. So we're not always going to get it right. In fact, it's a rare opportunity, a rare chance that we, we get it right, right? So to know what doesn't work, in my mind, is, is insanely important. And the more we can sort of publicize, and I know that there's a lot of political will that's, that sort of says, no, no, don't, we don't really want to you know, know that public dollars aren't aren't working well, but it's the reality, right? That it's, we're going to figure out that certain things don't work, and, and to learn from that is huge. So I think foundations definitely do, and donors are interested. Uh, as Robert mentioned, this group of young, younger folks that are coming up, it's like social investing. What's, you know, they want to know, really, what, what's working, what's not, how do you know, um, and what works for particular populations. Why does that work? All this stuff. And so I think the more we can publicize about that, about what doesn't work, the better. And accept that we're not always going to get it right. Any other questions? Yes? Could you explain a little more about the concept you talked about where relapse was being used as a measure of engagement? I, I didn't really pick up on that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important thing. Sure. Through, um, and, yeah, through their... Um, through their performance management, Roca was able to see that clients would always relapse in the process of their work with them. When they relapsed in the first stage, they have three phases of, uh, of programming. Phase one, phase two, phase three. And the, the phase one is really focused on engagement, bringing that client and having the client really attached to, to the staff. When they relapsed in that phase, they would recover much more quickly than when they relapsed in the later phases. This is my understanding of it. I really hope I'm doing it justice. Um, I mean, I, would, I should say, you should, we should probably go to the organization to know, but this is my understanding. And David Hunter actually might be able to speak to this better than I, or definitely would be able to. But, it's, but, but basically, they were able to see that they needed to, keep, they needed to have that happen before the client moved, uh, moved forward so that they could have a quicker recovery. One, one of the, I work, I work with yeah. Misha, and one of the concepts of play here is that the relationship that's being developed between the staff and the participant needs to be tested for strength, right, for resolve. That they're going to actually make a connection that withstands the kinds of things that are coming as they put them through the program. And so um, that's part, very much part of their model. And so essentially, if there's not been a relapse, there's a suspicion, if not a certainty, that the youth worker has not been uh, in, um, working as actively and intentionally as necessary. As, as actively and intentionally as necessary to drive a, uh, a relationship forward in which a young person makes a commitment to changing his or her life. And if you, are go, and if you go too quickly, you'll push the person away, but if you go too um, uh, moderately, um, then the, the relapse, which is almost inevitable with this target population, is going to happen at a point where it's going to be doing much more damage. And so therefore, you really need to understand um, that these youth workers are, are, are stressing the relationships enough to drive change in the young people they're engaging with. And an indicator of that is that there is a relapse or two at a relatively early point in the relationship. Does that make sense to you? 
It, and it actually, we go through that in the film really well. And I will say, actually, I just realized that Anisha is here. And I won't point her out, or she might kill me. But if, you've, if you just look for her, you've seen her on the screen, you might be able to find her. And you could, you know, talk to her more about it. Um, one last question. Yes. Yeah, the, the scenario that you just outlined was great um, clinical scenario and one that I think most of us have a lot of appreciation for, but I'm trying to make the connect relative to the software and the oh. tracking process. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Sure, I mean, we could go back to the indicators, the way that they built in the stages of change into the software, so that every time a case manager is working with a participant, they're able to enter into the system where that participant is on the stages of change. Does that make sense? And I think there's other way, too, with the transformational relationship, which is a more overarching um, issue that they're tracking, they're able to also be able to see at every point where that participant is in relation to the transformational relationship. You know? Hi. Um, but you also mentioned that that was somewhat subjective mm -hmm. and how that was measured and, and just sort of the metrics of all of that. Can you talk a little bit about how that was addressed to make it a little more, a little easier to track and to, to focus on and make it less subjective? Well, I think what, what I mean by the subjective piece is just that I, as a case manager, might consider Frank not quite at engagement, where someone else might decide that you know, he's at a different stage, right? right. And, um, and, and so, and I think, well, David, do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I, Since Anisha is speaking up, I'll, I'll try and do it justice. <laughs> uh, but I did, I did work with Barolka uh, with, um, on this. And there's, a, there's a couple of points. First of all, you can scale anything. All you have to do is, is write absolutely clear definitions of each level of the scale. Right? And only one thing can change from one level to the next. If two things change, it's called a double-barreled scale, and then you never know why the, why the person moved up. It could be for A, for B, or for both, right? So only one thing can move up, right? But the key thing is, uh, several things have to happen, and, and Roca does this beautifully. First thing is you have to have, in your software, definitions of each stage. So when you click on it, um, people immediately have a reminder of what each stage means. Secondly, you have to not rely on each person's reading of that. You have to train people on what's called inter-rater reliability. You have to give them exercises to look at the same thing and see how they rate it and work and work and talk and talk and discuss things and discuss things until everybody rates the same event in the same way. And then you can have to remember that you have to do it again in three months or six months and that will go on forever. Yes. And that's what Odile and I, well, that's what we were talking about, is that it's, it's a continual process, right, of making sure yeah. that everyone has that same definition for the same behavior. Right, word. and the final thing that I think Roca does in a, in, in a I think it's brilliant, um, is that they don't leave it up to the frontline staff to make the final assessment of the relationship. The frontline staff must discuss it with their supervisor, and the, only the supervisor can change the value in the ETO software because ETO, as you know, has different access levels. So that, therefore, there has to be a clinically sophisticated conversation between the supervisor and the frontline staff to make sure that the assessment is appropriate. Now, does that get rid of all subjectivity? No. But you know what? Reading the presence of subatomic particles on X-ray film is also subjective. Um, and so it's really important not to hold our industry to standards that no other industry meets. Maybe one more question? We have one. Thank you. Um, since you indicated that uh, all of your clients had a recidivism rate and it, it was really scaled in at the very beginning, versus you were hoping that it was going to be scaled in at the beginning, and that you would have opportunity to work with them. Did you come up with sort of a subscale after that? Um, since everybody relapses and you indicated that um, it would be more difficult for that person to come back again and to start this process again, how'd you deal with that? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not actually my program. It's the program of ROCA. So I just did the, the interviewing and Do the you know research how they dealt of them. Um, I, I can't speak to to that part of it. Oh, good. Anisha, yay! <laughs> I walked into myself on the screen and thought I was gonna like walk out. <laughs> um, so can you just repeat it uh, so I can understand the question on that? Sure. Um, 
you indicated, the speaker indicated that all of your clients relapsed and that when they did relapse, it was more difficult for them to stay engaged in the process. And therefore, you had to work with them, um, start them all over again. How did you deal with those, that population, well, everyone's the whole population, everybody relapses, I guess. How did you deal with them afterwards? So because we built relapse into the part of our program, it's part of how we run our business. Um, it's not necessarily dealing with them after relapse, or it, we understand it to be part of the process. Our, our model is really about behavior change, and so the stages of change are focused on a process of helping people change behaviors over time. Relapse, if you think about addiction models, it makes a lot of sense, right? So, you know, trying to quit smoking or drinking or those kinds of things. And so those stages of change are really used as indicators to help staff think about be very intentional and strategic with their work with each individual young person based on where they are in their readiness, willingness, and ability to make changes. And we know relapse is a part of it, so then it's about how we use ourselves in that relapse process to keep them engaged. And we use you know, a lot of different measures. We do a lot of attendance measures for our other programs, a lot of quarterly surveys, those kind of things to fill data around those scales so that we can assess also if staff are making the right assessment of those stages of change. And as David said, you know, when they move from one phase to another, that's a conversation with the supervisor because we want to ensure that we have the right kind of supports around that young person. The idea of the relapse is that people fail. And in most programs when people fail, they're kicked out, right? And ours is we know it's a part of it, so we're going to fail and we're not going anywhere and we're going to stay with you. So, when Kate was talking about um, when people relapse in the later phase of the relationship, uh, if they experienced a dip and a relapse in the engagement phase, but the youth worker was able to re-engage them, that relationship was stronger. It was like, like David, or Steve said too, that the relationship was tested. The young person knew we weren't going away because they messed up. And then when they relapsed later around a significant behavior change like a substance abuse, because of the strength of that relationship, we could go engage with them more quickly and get back to the point of either action or contemplation where they were to continue the progression of their behavior change. So it's, it's built into the thinking. So it's not, you know, and because we know that's going to happen, uh, the, the road in is it's circular. Everything's built for the relapse so they can keep cycling. <coughs> Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you.